సరే సార్ ఓకే మనోజ్ రెడీ యూనివర్సిటీ Uh, Michael is known for his scholarship on Buddhism. I mean, he is a globally reputed scholar. And you will be happy to know, friends, that as soon as I requested Michael to address us at Vishwam Harati, Michael immediately agreed. But he is terribly tied up with all kinds of commitments. Uh, besides being a very serious scholar on Buddhism, besides being occupied with his own writings, Michael is also busy handling administration at the University of Hamburg. Yet we had time together. We spent you know, very useful time together when I was in Hamburg with them. And I think my Hamburg stay would not have been so enjoyable had Michael not been there. So Michael, I'm really grateful to you personally. And I am grateful to you on behalf of the university community. uh because um, they will now have a chance to be acquainted with your scholarship on buddhism and you know we have 
uh, uh, very good departments, um, uh, not on Buddhist studies, but in the Chinese studies and the Department of History, ancient Indian history. There we teach Buddhism as part of the curricula. So I'm sure there are students and uh, there are colleagues uh, who will um, have the opportunity to listen to you. And um, uh, with the format is you will speak for what, half an hour, 40 minutes, Michael? Okay, yeah, and I'll, then- As long as you give me, I will speak. No, no, I mean, it's up to you. I mean, you can speak uh, you know, for hours together. We don't mind listening to you because I know you're a good speaker and very you know, enjoyable to listen to you. No, but you know, the format is once you finish, we'll have question answer if you don't mind. Uh, you know, some of the questions, you know, it depends again, And but I can't offer you either a beer or a cup of tea because we are meeting virtually. So that's due, that's, you know, that's a kind of rain check. Yeah, you are having a cup of tea. The rain check, you know, once you come to Shantani Ketan, we'll give you a kind of, you know, uh, treatment in a royal style. That's okay. guaranteed. So yes. you are sure that you are, you are likely to come to Shantani Ketan very soon once this okay. pandemic Every thing is over. So mm -hmm. after you know this introduction, because I can carry on talking about Michael you know, for hours together. <laughs> so because we are so uh, you know, close friends uh, together, and Michael is also a good friend of my family. Actually, my daughter is very fond of Michael, so she is listening to my uh, Michael's lecture today. Uh, um, with these words, again, Michael, I thank you. I welcome to this uh, lecture series, which is uh, something which I had began when I joined Vishwamarati. And we hold this kind of lecture once a month. And normally we prefer, you know, uh, scholars from various fields. Uh, so uh, I mean, today we are fortunate that we are going to have a scholar in Buddhism. That's a rare thing for us to have an opportunity. So I think with these words, Michael, the floor is yours and please carry on. Okay, thank you very much, Bidyu. That was a very nice introduction. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, if during the lecture the tone breaks down or something, just let me know because I usually teach online and sometimes my students say, I can't, we can't hear you now. Then just give me a sign and we have to rearrange something. But as long as I don't hear anything from you, uh, it should be fine and I assume you can understand me uh, well. So, uh, Bidyut, once again, thank you for inviting me to this very prestigious series. It's great to see you in office. Normally, I saw you working here as a scholar, very busy with writing from the morning till night. But now I can see you in your administrative duties, in your function, in your important function. So that's maybe a little bit a different Bidyut, as I know you from here, as being just a very productive and very diligent scholar in, in Germany. And I'm also pleased to have been invited, given that, as I saw, most of the presentations until now, probably depending on your orientation, is more in the field of social sciences. So I'm not a social scientist, and I think it's good for a university famous as yours that uh, you will have to hear something also about uh, the field of the humanities, namely uh, Buddhism, uh, Buddhist history, uh, Buddhist ethics in general. So before I start, may I share my screen uh, with the PowerPoint? Is that okay with you? So, yes, Michael, that's okay. That's, you go ahead with the PowerPoint presentation, no problem. Yeah, I only need to get permission from the organizer, from the host. He just has to put the hook and then it will be fine. Yes, sir, it will be given. Okay, up to now is not possible, but it takes some time maybe. Yes, sir. Raj is. Raj, permission, Yeah. Raj, permission, Raj, permission. It's not yet possible. It says that the host has deactivated their permission. So. Raj. Yeah. Raj, please look into the issue. Still not working yet. Because I wanted to show you some nice photos of Hamburg University. Yeah, it's, it's there. It's there. No? It, it, the permission is given, I'm told. 
Okay, now it's fine. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir, it is visible, clearly visible. Yeah, it's clearly visible. Very good. Yeah. Very excellent. And you are also audible, sir. So um, let me let me tell you some words about uh, this university and, and myself also, even though Bidyut has already introduced me. You can see this is the University of Hamburg on a very special day, namely with blue sky. I'm afraid that different to India, there are not so many blue sky days as you might be used to. But uh, if you're lucky, it can be a, a very nice city with a big lake in the center of the town. I think Bidyut used to take uh, many walks there. And you can see uh, the building of the university in the center. It's an old building, about 100 years old. And on its right hand side, yeah, if you look here, the new building, uh, this one here, uh, that's the so-called Asia Africa Institute. By the way, Hamburg became uh, what we call Excellence Universität in Germany. So it's a university of excellence. That's something which happened only, uh, I think, last year or two years ago. Up to then, uh, it was just a normal university, but now it is one of the top-ranked German universities. There are only um, 11 universities in Germany, which are top ranked like this. So Hamburg has become part of that very recently due to several factors, which, uh, well, we don't have to go into that. So we're very proud of that, of being part of the so-called German Ivory League. And if you look into this university, you have this nice institute, which is called the ASEAN Africa Institute. So the Asia Africa Institute which is uh, one of the largest institutions in Europe, uh, at, certainly in Germany, but also in Europe, comparable to the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, which deals, as the name says, with culture, history, and languages of Asia and Africa, mostly Asia. And you can see we have a lot of departments for Japan, China, Korea, Southeast Asia, yeah, Southeast Asia comprising Thailand, uh, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Uh, we have India in Tibet. We have the, uh, near, uh, the Near East. We have African studies and Ethiopian studies. And uh, embedded into these uh, Asian institutions is also the Buddhist Studies Center. Yeah, here you can see the inside of our uh, Asia Africa Institute on a good day. It's one of the largest. We have about 1,400 major students and a couple of thousand more who study minors here. And it's one of the characteristics of our institute that we are not dealing much with contemporary social and economic developments, but we are more focused on the history, the language and the culture of uh, these places in Asia. So it's a very nice place. Whenever you have a chance to come to Europe, to Germany, to Hamburg, please let me know. Uh, you can see these nice places here. Within uh, the Asia Africa Institute, you can see they have the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies. It's uh, so to say a small department within the university. You can see the web page address on the top, Buddhismuskunde Uni Hamburg, which offers all kinds of uh, things. Especially, uh, I would like to draw your attention to this field here, namely publications. We have a publication series of books which are becoming online after one year, all in free access style. And you can find all kinds of precious writings on the history of Buddhism, mostly on the history of Mahayana Buddhism here, free of charge. So have a look if you haven't done it yet. You can see this is my specialization, namely Buddhism as such. And that is uh, what I will be talking about today. I myself have been trained here in Hamburg for some years, uh, then uh, working in Nepal for um, <laughs> working in Nepal for the German manuscript, German Nepalese manuscript uh, project. And uh, then after some years in the US at Stanford University got an offer here to come back to Germany at Hamburg University and I'm representing Indian Buddhism. Uh, that means that uh, my main field of expertise is uh, Mahayana Buddhism. So starting at around uh, the beginning of the common era and I have been trained in reading texts in its primary languages and its original languages, mostly Sanskrit, 
But uh, as you know, when you study Mahayana Buddhism, also Tibetan and Chinese is very important. So I try to make use of all these three uh, languages in order to see what the intellectual history, the philosophical history of Indian Buddhism, especially Indian Mahayana Buddhism is like. Besides that, I'm also interested in the relation between uh, Buddhism and violence, especially also Buddhism and warfare. But when we talk about Buddhism and violence, and this is uh, the topic of today's talk, the relation of Buddhism and violence, is it a contradiction or what? Yeah, no, I don't think we only can talk about a warfare as violence, but we also have to consider issues like uh, what is called structural violence, like, for instance, discrimination of minorities, questions of gender equality, a big topic nowadays in Buddhism. And of course, also, as it is a big issue here in Europe, the protection of animal rights. Uh, this is all somehow, I think, to be considered under the category of um, violence as such. So it's not just brutal physical violence, but other forms as well. Of course, today I can't, um, I can't give you a, a complete overview of that. That would be uh, impossible. It's too much and too long. The time is too much to talk about 2,500 years of Buddhist history. So just like a kaleidoscope, I will just give you some, some ideas today, what I think and what uh, always touched me in a sense when I was dealing with the issue of Buddhism and violence. Let me start with a very personal story, which I would like to share with you, uh, namely maybe around 20 years ago when I came first time to Japan, I got a scholarship in Japan to do there my PhD. And I arrived at the airport in Kyoto. And um, at that time I was considering myself to be a Buddhist. And of course, as most Western Buddhists would do, uh, I was a vegetarian at that time. So no, no meat, no fish, uh, just eating a vegetarian cost. And when I arrived at the airport, I was picked up by one, by one of the leading um, head priests of Japan, who always was associated with the scholarship, which I got. So a uh, representative, an official representative of a big Buddhist school in Japan. And we talked about uh, our lives. And I told him that I'm a Buddhist. And I told him very proudly that I'm a vegetarian, which I took for granted that any Buddhist should be a vegetarian. And his reaction was, was quite shocking to me because he said, oh no, why are you vegetarian? That's very bad indeed. And I was so shocked and I couldn't understand why he said that. Uh, uh, when I inquired and asked, he said, well, uh, in our form of Buddhism, which is uh, the so-called Amida Buddhism, yeah, it comes from the Indian Amitabha or Amitayus Buddha, uh, we assume that you can only reach something on your way to getting out of samsara by getting help and grace from the almighty Buddha Amida. Whenever you try to do something by yourself, it's a kind of ascetic striving, a kind of ascetic exercise that will not lead you anywhere. So I started to understand that obviously uh, this man, this priest assumed that uh, being a vegetarian somehow equals with uh, striving like an ascetic for something special I want to gain. And he said, if you think that you could do that, that you could reach some better position in your afterlife or in your rebirth by being vegetarian, it's failed because everything you get depends on the grace of Amida Buddha. That was very shocking for me at that time. I was young. And as I said, I took it for granted that Buddhists who talk a lot about compassion, not only with human beings, but with all sentient beings, how could they eat animals? How could they kill and eat animals? So this was uh, one of the riddles which actually brought me closer to look into these uh, questions and trying to understand uh, what the general um, position of Buddhism to violence, uh, of religions and violence is. But maybe we will come back to this topic later on. So uh, generally speaking, I think you could argue in two different ways. There's certainly one group of people. Yeah, our students, for instance, here at Hamburg, they are very sweet and nice. They, they don't want to speak bad about anything. You usually what you hear is they say, well, Michael, I can't hear you. Yeah. 
Michael. Can can the others hear me or? And now now I can hear. You. Now I can hear. You. Ah, yes. okay. Your your photograph got frozen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says the internet connection is unstable. I don't know okay. why. Okay, so carry on, please. Carry on. Okay. So this, this is one position you can take. You can say all religions are equally good. They want the good of human beings. It is not audible. Do you think it's an in, do you think it's an internet problem or is it a, a problem of the micro or something? I don't know. Your uh, photograph is frozen now. Mm -hmm. You are just you know, yeah. Now it's okay. Now I can see you moving. Yeah. Now it should be stable, but it's possible that at this time of the day, you know, there are many classes that the connection gets unstable. I'm not sure what the problem is. But anyway, carry on. We'll just. Uh, I, I could switch off the, my video if you like, then you can't see me, but you can hear me, but. I think if that, that's okay, if, if, if that will improve the presentation, I don't mind actually. Okay, so let me try uh, to switch yeah. off the video. But you should be able to hear me better now once the, the video yeah, is Yeah, now I can hear you properly. Yeah, so this is, this is the standpoint number one that people say, uh, religion has been instrumentalized by human beings, by institutions, and they have misunderstood what religions actually want, and they misuse religion. And that's how violence comes into uh, the religion itself. But there's another way of looking at that. And those of you who have dealt a little bit with uh, religious studies, religious studies history, of course, you will know uh, there's another theory, there's another idea, which basically argues that um, religion for a society is just one function, namely one of the functions of religion is to channel violence. Human beings are violent, no doubt about that. We are, we are very, I think, aggressive beings and it's not always easy to keep that. So religion has the function to somehow channel, to collect this violence and uh, use it in a kind of organized way. Yeah, if you look for instance at uh, Christianity, the symbol of Christianity is the crucified Jesus on the on the crucifix. Yeah, that's a very cruel, a very cruel symbol. Somebody who has been crucified, the nails through his hands. This is certainly very violent, but it's an organized, a ritualized violence, which can somehow maybe have the aim to prevent people uh, for committing violence by already having a symbol, by already having this way of you know celebrating violence in a more ritualized way. You have it also uh, in other religions like, uh, like Hinduism. I think when I traveled to Calcutta many years ago, I saw there is a temple and uh, the priests cut off the heads of the, the goats there. That's also very violent, of course, to cut the, the head of a living being, but it's certainly considered something positive. I don't know exactly what, but it's probably a donation to the gods. But indeed it's a, a violent thing, but it's a ritualized violence. Nobody has to fear. It's so to say the wish for violence channeled in a religious way and put into practice. And in the end, this might protect the society because violence becomes domesticated and not applicable anymore on the streets if you want. Yeah, and I think you can find these kind of uh, violent aspects in all religions. So that would be a different perspective you take when looking on religion, not that religion is always pure and, and free of violence, but uh, you could see that religions have incorporated, built uh, these kind of violent things into itself. Yeah, if you take, for instance, Buddhism, you can also find very uh, tough ways of meditation, of torturing your own body, not too much, but to put it under pressure and to sit for a long time. You know, this could also go as violence, but it's a ritualized way of violence. So I think that it is true to say that all religions in the world probably have some aspects of violence, and uh, I think Buddhism is not an exception there. That is, uh, so to say, the starting point from, from where I uh, start to talk today. By the way, when I talk about Buddhism, of course, you have to be aware that this is uh, already uh, an 
almost impossible endeavor because Buddhism has a history of more than 2,500 years. It is stretching now throughout of Asia and also reaching the Western countries. So each country, each time, each people, each culture has developed its own form of Buddhism. And uh, many things what I will talk about today, of course, has a tendency to be oversimplified. But anyway, the recent years have shown a growing number of publications dealing with the relation between Buddhism and violence. Um, let me show you here our next slide. Yeah, uh, you can see here, for instance, uh, this is Angulimala, a serious killer who is attacking the Buddha. And the Buddha reacts, of course, with complete nonviolence. There is, uh, in the recent years, you have had more and more publications on the issue of Buddhist violence. One very famous one is this year by Jerison and Jürgensmeier, published, I think, in 2005 or so. It's called Buddhist Warfare. So this is something which is growing publications on this issue. Uh, started actually 1957 by uh, a famous European scholar called Paul Demiewel, who wrote a book in French called Le Buddhisme et la Guerre, yeah, Buddhism and War. And uh, in there, he has written a lot about East Asian traditions of Buddhism engaged in warfare, the so-called um, monk warriors, priest warriors in Japan are a good example of that. So that's something quite uh, normal nowadays. Yeah, nowadays you also get uh, publications on um, contemporary affairs of Buddhism. You have, for instance, seen that the civil war in Sri Lanka in the 1980s and 90s, lasting into uh, this century, has brought a lot of research of scholars on Buddhism in that situation not only on Buddhist monks, but uh, interviews with soldiers, uh, asking them how they feel uh, when they have to go to war, if they can do that as a Buddhist or not. And this altogether has led to, I would say, a new evaluation of Buddhism in recent years, namely up to 20, 30 years ago, Buddhism was basically, at least here in the West, taken as a complete um, violence-free religion, yeah, the Dalai Lama as its main exponent, and people would not associate any instances of violence with Buddhism, but growing publications on this issue have shown that this is basically not the case. Uh, even yeah, when you look into uh, the real life, you can see there are a lot of instances of uh, Buddhist violence, but even if you look into the doctrinal background of Buddhism, yeah, the scriptures of early Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, you will find that there are instances in which uh, Buddhists might promote or might not completely refrain from violence. And in so far, I think it's fair to say that uh, also Buddhism cannot be entitled a completely violence-free uh, religion. So, let me see now. So what I will do today is I will not talk much about uh, the real Geschichte, the, the material history, yeah, the conflicts in social sciences and political history. There are other people who can do much better that, but I want to talk about um, yeah, how um, the source text of Buddhism position themselves uh, to violence, what they have to say. And of course, you have to keep in mind that there's a historical development from early Buddhism to later Mahayana developments. So let me start with some general remarks on the position of violence in the earliest strata yeah, of Buddhist text. And when I say the earliest strata, uh, it doesn't mean we know what the Buddha exactly taught, but we know what the Pali tradition of Buddhism, which is nowadays available in Theravada countries like Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, uh, has to say about that. Here, the term ahimsa, you all know that, of course, comes immediately to mind uh, in the Indian context. Literal translation would be non-injury. In the history of Buddhism, the idea of not intentionally injuring or killing other sentient beings seems to have been of utmost importance from the very outset. This is reflected in the position ahimsa maintains in the first 
and often said most important of the five Buddhist lay precepts. Namely, you see them here at the board, non-killing yeah, or non-injuring, this is ahimsa, avoiding theft and cheating, avoiding sexual misconduct, avoiding lying and other forms of wrong speech, and the last one, which probably was only added later, avoiding intoxicants. Yeah, there can be no doubt that ahimsa, uh, nonviolence, has a really, really important position in this earliest strata of Buddhism. One old, fairly specific explanation of this ahimsa rule in the Pali Canon runs as follows. And again, have a look at the slide. It says, laying aside violence in respect of all beings, both those which are still and those which move, he should not kill a living being, nor cause to kill, nor approve of others killing. Yeah, interesting here, uh, those things who are still and those which move, yeah, those who are still probably plants, later on plants were not considered as living beings anymore in Buddhism, but in the early phase, you can see that also plants had this kind of uh, position of almost being a living being. That is from the Sutta Nipata, and we have another one from the canonical material of Pali Buddhism, Majjhima Nikaya, Diga Nikaya, which says simply, abandoning the killing of living beings, he abstains from this, with rot and weapon laid aside, gentle with sympathy, caring for the welfare of all living beings. Yeah, this is a more positive description, namely with sympathy and care for the welfare of all living beings. Very important, I never miss this chance to uh, tell it to my students. It doesn't say caring for the welfare of all human beings, it says caring for the welfare of all living beings. And there can be no doubt that, it, that in this living beings also Animals are included, of course. In Sanskrit, of course, sarva sattva. In Tibetan, semchen. So the core of this Ahimsa doctrine is here very generally formulated. Depending on which of the early Buddhist traditions we are dealing with, we even find passages which, referring to lay Buddhist, explicitly include the non-injury of ants, and you could say uh, other insects as well. That's really difficult, I think. The strict prohibition or injuring or killing living beings may indeed have an ethical ring to it. However, another underlying factor is surely the ascetic roots from which Buddhism evolved, implying a strong individualized search for liberation, namely the search for amrita, for immortality, a state beyond all forms of samsaric life. Yeah, so what I would say is one reason uh, not to, not to uh, injure other sentient beings is, of course, that you don't want to do bad things to them. But uh, I think another aspect of that is that yourself want to keep clean of any kind of sin, any kind of evil doing. And that's why you have to abstain from injuring sentient beings. So uh, there are these two aspects, at least. The precept of non-injury may to a certain degree be related to the main concern of the Indian ascetic, namely to avoid all possible factors which could contribute to a contamination of his mind. Yeah, in Sanskrit, for this often the term klesha, klesha, or asrava is used. A willful injury, yeah, if you hit a sentient being, or so let alone kill a sentient being, uh, this would certainly figure very high on the scale of such contamination of your mind, reinforcing the practitioner's bonds to samsara and leading him or her to further away from the goal of deliverance. Yeah? So uh, killing would certainly be a strong bond to keep you here in samsara, but the aim of Buddhism, as you all know, is to get out of samsara. With emphasis being put on the individual struggle for the purity of one's own mind, it comes as no surprise that another important text, namely the so-called Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya, that's a kind of scholastic text from the fourth or fifth century written in India. Uh, and in this text, it is stated that even killing in self-defense or in order to protect a friend is regarded as a violation of the Ahimsa precept. precept. Yeah, that's astonishing, of course. Even self-defense is uh, a violation of this principle. Within the scale of values on which such considerations are based, spiritual purity obviously occupies a higher position than the protection of your samsaric existence 
even that of a close friend. So until now, I have exclusively dealt with aspects of private nonviolence. And you have seen that these instances of uh, private nonviolence are very radical. Yeah, There is very little room to argue that, yes, you should be physically violent in any instance. But what is the stand of early Buddhism with regard to engaging in public violence, such as warfare and punishment? Here, as you may well be aware, we are touching on the fringes of a highly controversial and ideological discussion on the nature of early Buddhism. The historical Buddha is sometimes depicted as a social reformer, keen to revolutionize the existing social order, favoring the political model of a democratic republic and teaching his followers the virtues of active social engagement. Not that I personally would dislike such an individual and indeed, I do not rule out that he may have wished for changes in the society into which he was born. However, the spirit, I think, of Buddhism's oldest literary transmission does not encourage such a picture. This is particularly evident in what is said about the Buddha's encounters with contemporary kings. In none of these encounters is the Buddha said to deal with concrete questions regarding the real politics or the real political issues being pursued by the rulers. The Buddha presents his moral principles in a fairly general way, avoiding direct references to issues of royal policy. A balance of powers, as André Barrault already in the 1990s uh, called it, describes this fundamental equipoise, this fundamental balance between, on the one hand, the spiritual authority of the Buddha, and on the other hand, the worldly power of the sovereign. And that characterizes the mutual relation perfectly. Yeah, on the one hand, you have the king of the spiritual realm, which is the Buddha. And on the other hand, you have the Chakravartin, the ruler, which is, of course, the ruler of uh, the world itself, not the spiritual world. Neither of the two sides would have intruded into what is seen as the other's domain of power. The Buddha, known for his pragmatic approach to the question how to avoid further samsaric suffering, primarily taught spiritual self-perfection and the moral guidelines necessary. The king, on the other hand, tried to fulfill his traditional royal duties, namely the protection of his subjects from aggressors inside and outside the country. Or, as the old Indian law books laid down, he was obliged to respect religious plurality. Thus, he granted audiences to different religious representatives and listened to what they had to say. However, the idea that religious mendicants like the Buddha would have lectured the king about political issues seems very far-fetched to me. Mendicants, ascetics, including the Buddha, were in need of the toleration of kings. For most of a year, they were wandering around the Gangetic Plain, which was divided into various kingdoms and so-called republics. Political counsel to one ruler would have made them suspect in the eyes of another. The Buddha would have run the risk that he and his followers could be accused of taking sides with one particular ruler, an outcome which would have impeded the security of his followers. Similar reasons can be suspected behind the Buddha's prohibition on accepting soldiers into his monastic order. This prohibition is found in the rules governing the monastic order of the Theravadins. It's a Buddhist school in the south in Sri Lanka. One story has it that soldiers who had been ordered by King Bimbisara into the battle had shirked the duty by getting themselves admitted to the Buddhist order. The king, who was a friend of the Buddha, promptly complained to him, whereupon the Buddha issued the prohibition. The Buddha Gautama doubtlessly would have had quite a lot to say about the guiding rules of Indian kingship as found laid down in the old law books and in writings on monarchical rule of which, for instance, Kautalya's Artha Shastra is the best known example. I've seen that, I think, uh, Bidyut has delivered a lecture on Kautalya's Artha Shastra in exactly this series. So we have writings in which Buddhists quite vehemently criticize this kind of Artha Shastra writings. It's generally assumed that this science of statecraft had a long tradition in India and was in one or the other form already orally being transmitted at the time of the historical Buddha. These works document the duty of every ruler to tend to the prosperity of the realm, to win new territory, and to apply such 
expansionist policy towards weaker states, even by means of physical coercion. There's nothing in these works animated as they are by an out and out pragmatism, expansionism and Machiavellianism that hints at an acceptance and observance of ethical standards or the adherence to religious obligations. Kings classically were members of the warrior caste, the Kshatriyas. They considered, it, they considered this as their specific duty, a duty that had been entrusted with since Vedic times to engage in warfare and, if all went well, to meet the death on the battlefield. Only this would guarantee them a rebirth in heaven. The extent to which these ideals of Indian kingship were followed can, in my opinion, hardly be overestimated. We even read of medieval rulers in Sri Lanka who, though Buddhist in their religious convictions, studied those traditional royal guidelines zealously. For a small kingdom, it would have been difficult to survive with a radically pacifist orientation. Sooner or later, it would have been swallowed up by one of its neighbors, for which it had become an easy prey. This is, I must say, the unpleasant background of power politics at the time of the historical Buddha, a background we need to take into account when reflecting about Gautama's, I would say, apolitical or non-political attitude. An excellent illustration of how highly opposed values could coexist in even one and the same person is a soldier who carries a water filter on war expeditions he participates in. That's a story which comes from the Theravada Vinaya. The filter, so he says, protects him from unintentionally swallowing and killing small animals who might be contained in the water. The assumption that uh, this soldier would try even harder to spare the lives of his enemies, yeah, they are also living beings, is quickly brushed aside. He argues that whereas the small creatures are peaceful, not having revolted against his king and therefore worthy of his compassion, the situation regarding the enemy soldiers is different. Their hostility must be neutralized in accordance with the warrior code, which in the end means killing them on the battlefield. There's a similar story of the general Siha, also taken from the Vinaya, who argues that he would not intentionally kill any living being, even in order to save his own life. This, as you might expect, he does not say in a fit of remorse before proclaiming his retirement from military service. He's rather stressing that the meat which he has offered to the Buddha as a meal did not come from an animal that had been slaughtered by himself or that he had ordered to be slaughtered by somebody else. There is no hint that his deadly professional duties, yeah, he's a general, a soldier, which he continues to fulfill in any way conflict with this compassionate attitude. These cases may appear bizarre to us, but nevertheless demonstrate at least two important facts. First, particular duties and norms, yeah, caste-specific obligations, if you want, uh, in Sanskrit often called svadharma, could take precedence over universally formulated ethic principles, such as for prohibition to injure or kill sentient beings. Yeah, obviously, this is the case uh, for the soldier and the general. He says, it's my job to fight. But of course, if I can save minute living beings in the water, I will do that with my filter. The ascetic roots and character of early Buddhism may to a certain extent be responsible for this. Though Buddhism was less rigid than, for example, its sister movement, Jainism, for certain sectors of a society, such universally valid and uncompromising ethical standards would be difficult to follow without coming into conflict with certain caste-specific obligations. Secondly, seen against the background of a continuous power struggle going on in India at the time of the Buddha, his rather ascetic ethical code would be of little or no use for the ruling class if their members intended to remain in power while adopting an all-inclusive Buddhist lifestyle. A rare but clear stance on the question of killing in warfare from the mouth of the Buddha himself is found in a sutra which is called the Sutra of a Professional Soldier, the Yodajiva Sutta. In it, a soldier who subscribes to the notion that a heroic death on the battlefield results in favorable conditions beyond the grave is sharply contradicted by the Buddha. The 
Buddha says that it is not the company of gods which awaits him, but hellish tortures. Since, and that is an interesting reason, at the moment of death, this person, this soldier, had the desire to kill enemy soldiers. Now, that's a very important point in Buddhism. The last moments, the last seconds of your, of your uh, mood in life decide how you will be reborn. And given that this soldier is driven by the wish to kill others, his rebirth will be quite terrible, so says the Buddha. The Abhidhamma Kosha, which I had already mentioned before, 4th, 5th century, follows along much the same lines in considering um, the case of soldiers who not only individual act in killings, but uh, they act as a group, and he says that this is not good. He condemns the general mutual incitement to killing in war, in which case it is immaterial who exactly has performed the fatal act. Yeah, if you have been uh, with them, if you have been trying to, to kill them, if you have been there, you are equally guilty, and you will accumulate problematic karmic consequences. The situation, however, so the Abhidhamma Kosha is different if the soldier makes the firm resolve that he will definitely not kill anybody, even for the sake of saving his own life. Yeah, a resolution which I think uh, is not likely to be very attractive for a soldier who is sent into battle. Of course, he has to fight and he has to defend himself. If not, uh, he will die very quickly. Yeah, let me add another interesting case, namely that of the Emperor Ashoka who ruled over most of the Indian subcontinent in the middle of the third century BC. It seems that he became a Buddhist lay follower and tried to govern with as little violence as possible based on principles associated with Buddhist ethics. But be it noted, he became a Buddhist only after ruthlessly conquering the parts of his realm, which he had not inherited, namely in particular the land of the Kalingas, in campaigns that accepted untold death. Later, in a famous inscription, he repented his cruel bloodshed. However, there is no doubting that even after his conversion, he continued to maintain a combat-ready army, and that probably also the death penalty was carried out by him. What I want to point out here is that, as an ideal, Buddhist ethics had no place in politics in the time before Ashoka's conversion. Otherwise, we would hardly have come to hear of him as a celebrated figure he is known to us today. And certainly closely connected with Ashoka, there is the utopian ideal of the Buddhist Chakravartin, yeah, a wheel-turning world emperor. The formulation of this Buddhist ideal may well have been motivated, among other reasons, by the wish to make up for the lack of an explicit Buddhist ethics of rulership. This Chakravartin is said to conquer the whole earth by following at the head of his army, a wheel containing a thousand spokes. Local rulers everywhere welcome him upon arrival and are happy to surrender to him. After the emperor has in this manner conquered the four corners of the earth, he rules over it without any need to engage in punishment and without any need to engage in other violence. He encourages his subjects to live ethically according to the five precepts. There is no crime in his realm and no aggressor threatens his power. It is true that the emperor had to rely on the presence of his army in order to induce the surrender of the other rulers. However, nobody has been killed in the process of his expansionist enterprise, and in his resulting empire, there is no further need for even the threat of violence. What a wonderful idea. It's a simple, but I think a powerful utopia. This ideal impresses upon us even more forcefully the incompatibility between Buddhist code of Ahimsa and court politics, unless we believe that there were indeed rulers keen to place their sovereignty into the hands of the Chakravartin, an eventuality which I think does not deserve further discussion. I think this is out of question in uh, realpolitik. Nobody would do that. The Buddhist Chakravartin ideal is also alarming for the expansionist goal it formulates, and what makes it even worse, it seems to be backed by the threat of military action. Throughout the long history of Buddhism, this ideal surely fascinated rulers, some of whom claimed themselves to be a Buddhist Chakravartin, and in several cases we know that they employed brute military force when the neighbors did not behave in the welcoming way taken for granted in this utopia. Be that as it may, 
What is important for my inquiry here is that Chakravartin ideology does not provide any practical guidelines on how to deal with crimes and aggression from outside if they exist. It is based on the, and I think you all will agree, very optimistic claim that if all subjects and neighboring peoples became Buddhist, there would be no crime and no war and therefore no need for any public measures calling for the use of force. So um, this is, so to say, the first part of my lecture. I would now uh, like to introduce you to some more sources, namely uh, this time from the field of Mahayana Buddhism. So the great vehicle, which started to origin somehow uh, around the Kamen era, and then has its peak in the first five, 600 years of Buddhism in India. And of course, you know, that uh, a key value in this history of Mahayana Buddhism is compassion. There is a bodhisattva. The bodhisattva is somebody who is striving for awakening as a Buddha. He has a lot of compassion and his final goal is Buddhahood. So as a Buddha, he will be able to help other sentient beings also to attain a deliverance from samsara. So in this Mahayana set of Ahimsa, uh, would still, of course, be one of the major keystones for the Bodhisattva's moral makeup. However, its prominent position could now be seriously challenged. Yeah, the prominent position of Ahimsa could be challenged in cases where the Bodhisattva's failure to apply violence threatened to compromise his dedication to promote the spiritual benefit of all living beings. In other words, when compassion came into conflict with Ahimsa, it would be compassion to be the more important one. Yeah, I want to show you some passages in normative Mahayana texts, which testify that considerations of this kind were not at all an exception, I think. Yeah, have a look here at uh, the so-called Bodhisattva Bhumi, a text which is quite fundamental for the history of Buddhism, especially the history of Yogacara Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, and where you will find a passage which says, the Bodhisattva may behold a robber or thief engaged in committing a great many deeds of immediate retribution, being about to murder many hundreds of magnificent living beings, auditors, independent Buddhas and Bodhisattvas for the sake of a few material goods. Seeing it, the Bodhisattva forms his thought in his mind. He says, if I take the life of this robber, I may myself be reborn as one of the creatures of hell. Better that I be reborn a creature of hell than that this living being, having committed a deed of immediate retribution, should go straight to hell. With such an attitude, the Bodhisattva ascertains that the thought is virtuous and then takes the life of that living being, means he kills him. And the text says, there is no fault but spread of much merit. The last sentence is of particular interest since it plainly exempts the Bodhisattva from any negative karmic consequences. The contrary is suggested. Thanks to his compassion, he will accumulate merit. Karmic after effects are not always so kind. In the sutra called Upaya Kaushalya, the Upaya Kaushalya Sutra, the Buddha is depicted as a sea captain in one of his former lives. On board are 500 merchants, all of them bodhisattvas, along with one passenger who intends to kill all of these 500 bodhisattvas to steal their property. The captain comes to know about his plan and in order to prevent the evildoer from suffering in health, he kills the man, but not without great compassion as the text explicitly adds. So it's something you could call compassionate killing. The potential robber is thereupon reborn in a heaven and the captain's rebirths are shortened by a hundred thousand eons. In this story, however, karma isn't so easily thwarted. When the captain finally gets reborn as a Buddha Shakyamuni, a thorn enters his food while he is walking. Yeah, it's a famous story that once the Buddha stepped into an acacia thorn, uh, which uh, injured him quite heavily. This, the text explains then, is the end of the fruition of the deed of having killed the robber when he was the captain. The episode of the thorn is indeed important since it demonstrates that the prior use of violence, though motivated by compassion, was somehow felt to be problematic and counted still in Mahayana Buddhism also as a breach of the rule 
of non-injury. Yeah, so let me finally turn to uh, one other issue in the field of Mahayana Buddhism, namely that of public violence. Yeah, until now we have only talked about private violence, yeah, individual violence, but how about public violence in Mahayana Buddhism? An interesting passage of violence and war is found in a sutra with a long Sanskrit title, Bodhisattva Gochara Upaya Vishaya Vikurvana Nirdesha Sutra. I don't have to translate it here. The text is no longer preserved in Sanskrit in its Indian original. So if you deal with it, you have to go through its translations into Chinese and Tibetan. It is wholly a matter of speculation how wide the influence of this text was in its time in India, or even if it had ever had an effect at all on Buddhist rulers and statecraft. It can at least be regarded uh, as a kind of evidence that some groups of the great vehicle expected a king to act in this way as it is laid down here. The sutra contains a conversation between King Chanda Prayota and Satyaka Nigranta Putra, a future Buddha who imparts the true teaching of his interlocutor. During this long conversation, the question is discussed of how a king who is devoted to the Dharma, who's following the Dharma, a Dharma Raja, should a Buddhist king, uh, should act when he sees himself confronted by the enemy armed forces. And as the Chinese version adds, uh, if he sees that these forces want to attack his realm. Yeah? What is a Buddhist ruler supposed to do, a Dharma Raja? The king is supposed to coordinate, according to the text, on the basis of three major steps in the following sequence. Step number one, in order to avoid a military conflict, so that's the aim, avoid military conflict, three more or less diplomatic procedures should be successively applied. The first procedure, the king should attempt to obtain the enemy's good graces by means of friendliness. What is meant by this, as another text explains, is accentuating the exalted lineage of the opposing ruler and his family, praising his learnedness and his conduct, and stressing the inner bonds and good relations between their respective ancestors. Yeah, this is the first step. Second step, the king should show favors. Among these are the offerings of hostages consisting of prominent men, the renouncing of restitution of booty robbed in a campaign of conquest, and returning what one has unjustly appropriated oneself. And step number three, a final and no longer purely diplomatic remedy, the king is supposed to surround his adversary with his army and intimidate him into submission by showing his superiority of arms. Yeah, Atta Shastra, I think, shows you how he can also fake such superiority. There are always, uh, this is of course, quite similar to what you will find in Atta Shastra literature. With that, so in the view of our Mahayana Sutra, the scope for a diplomatic solution of the conflict is exhausted. So diplomacy ends here. If the impending conflict cannot be avoided by this means, direct contact with the enemy ceases and the king now turns to the second step. What is the second step? He first recalls to mind his basic kingly duty as the protector of his people. On the one hand, he must not bring his people to ruin in the process of conducting a war. On the other, he is compelled not to let his people fall into the plundering lands, hands of his opponent. He therefore decides to go to war, but listen, he recites it. Uh, he, he decides to go to war, but he is resolved not to kill the enemy soldiers, but to take them alive. The third step then describes the king in the middle of direct preparations for battle. He optimizes the striking capacity of the army and conjures his soldiers not to give ground on the battlefield. Finally, our text goes briefly into the consequences of military action for the king. It leaves no doubt that if the ruler bounds or even kills enemy soldiers, he is not threatened by any negative karmic results for the future. Rather, immeasurable merit accrues to him. For, as it says in the text, the king has followed all the previously mentioned rules, was ever filled with compassion and perseverance during his undertaking, and at the end, put his life, his well-being, and his family at risk for his people. Look at the uh, whiteboard. This is the uh, ending of the passage. It says, 
A king has made use of the above mentioned three steps and prepared his armed forces for battle, even if he kills or wounds the enemy warriors, not the smallest blemish, not a trace of misfortune and no negative karmic consequences fall his way. Why not? Because he has performed his task in an attitude of compassion and with no sense of resignation. A king who protects his subjects and offers his life and his material possessions for his children, wives and clan obtains immeasurable religious merit. Such a description of a Buddhist king who is devoted to the Dharma would scarcely, would scarcely be imaginable in a Buddhist treatise of the early period about we talked before, and was certainly not entirely uncontroversial even at the time when it was written. Our text follows a wholly pragmatic course, which would easily make it seem to Buddhist oriented rulers to be fit to function as a guideline. Within the description, there are a number of elements which deserve our attention in the first place, I'm thinking about the king's willingness to make concessions to his opponent in order to avoid the impending conflict through, so there has been uh, no prior hint of an enemy superiority. Also surprising is the resolution of the part of the ruler to capture enemies alive. The question to what extent this was at all a realistic resolution can be left hanging for the time. Such a resolution may conceal a feeling of responsibility to observe elementary rights during battle, for example, the injunction not to kill a soldier who is fleeing or has been surrendered, or the use of battle techniques and weapons that aim primarily not at killing the enemy, but inflicting non-lethal injury, uh, injury or otherwise putting the enemy temporarily out of action. Yeah, if you remember the, the 30 year war in Europe from 1618 to 1648, uh, one of the problems was how to deal with the captured soldiers because uh, you know you couldn't just let them die and there was not enough food to feed them so what some um, army leaders did is they just cut away their hands so as a as an act of mercy as an act of compassion to say okay you can keep your life but cutting off your hands will mean will mean that you can't uh, fight anymore and then they let them go in freedom yeah, finally, we find at the end of the text, uh, the central element compassion, about which I've already spoken and which is of no importance, I think, in any text of traditional Indian statecraft or Atta Shastra. However, it is not mentioned in the sutra in its all overall description of the king's conduct. Uh, this suggests that the authors may have felt uneasy with the notion of a war with compassion, yeah, a compassionate warfare, and so introduced this element only at the end of the text and the topic is the future consequences of the king. So let me let me stop here. I think one hour is enough for you to listen to me. Uh, but let me draw some very short general conclusions. First of all, you have seen that in early Buddhism, there's a strict ethics of ahimsa, a strict ethics of avoidance of violence on an individual level. Yeah, you have to keep to the precepts, of course, killing or telling others to kill is something which is completely unacceptable and it will destroy your progress on the way to deliverance. Secondly, we have seen the public violence in early Buddhism is not much touched on by the Buddha, but it's mainly left in the, um, in the field of the kings to decide. The Buddha lectures them, but he would probably avoid to say war is something bad, or you should not do warfare, you should not uh, behave that and this way. Yeah, of course, you have uh, other examples. I brought you a nice photo here. This is uh, a Buddhist monk in Sri Lanka, Venerable Ratana. I met him several years ago, and you can see that he has a very close context even to, to military leaders there. Yeah, From a Buddhist standpoint, at this time, it's very clear a Buddhist king cannot be a king. Yeah? A Buddhist cannot be a king because uh, being a king means to fight and to punish, and that would be unacceptable for uh, the early Buddhist stand of uh, Ahimsa. On the other hand, uh, this early strands offered, uh, offers a kind of utopia, uh, unrealistic and something which is not functioning well in theory in any of the idea of a Chakravartin. Uh, you have seen that is just a nice idea. Finally, and that was uh, the last chapter, when it comes to Mahayana Buddhism, you can see that now compassion trumps Ahimsa. Yeah, compassion, if in conflict with Ahimsa, becomes more important than Ahimsa and it would be given priority. It is the job of the Bodhisattva to be compassionate 
And when the Bodhisattva kills a sentient being, he does it with compassion in order to help that living beings, not in order to promote himself primarily. Yeah, so this is uh, something which is new, I think, in the development of uh, later Buddhist ideas. And uh, that comes along with uh, the figure of a Bodhisattva. Later on in East Asian Buddhism, in Tibetan Buddhism, we have the idea of a Bodhisattva being a ruler. So you can say that maybe under Mahayana ideas, new formulations of statecraft ethics for Buddhists have been developed so that the idea of a Chakravartin, of a Dharma Raja uh, has been taken serious. Maybe that's enough to give you some points of discussion and I will be happy to deal with any kind of questions, comments or uh, whatever you have to say to that. Thank you very much for your patience. So Michael, you are done? Yeah, I'm done. Yes. Now I'm I can see you. Now let us see your face. Yeah, uh, you should uh, see me now. Yes, I can see you now. And I'm sure uh, Nimai, question oh. answer. Sir, I have a question. Uh, I think, uh, sir, you can give your uh, opinion on the speech, then meanwhile we will get some questions. You see, uh, Nimai, Michael is a very dear friend of mine. Yes, sir. And, uh, uh, as a dear friend, I can say only very positive things. <laughs> Whenever I meet Michael, whether in the department or in the pub in Germany, uh, we used to discuss many things, starting from weather, starting from the Alstra Lake, and also, you know, academic stuff. So Michael can't be bad in his presentation. I mean, that's, yes. that's my comment, the first comment. And secondly, you know, about Buddhism and violence, the point which he made, and that's a very unconventional kind of you know, approach to Buddhism, because when you talk of Buddhism, Buddhism is tilted in favor of Ahimsa. I mean, that's a normal, standard, uh, universally acceptable position. But Michael had, has shown, you know, in so many points, also some of the photographs, that that's not the case. But Buddhist approach to um, Ahimsa or is different from what we conceive as our approach to Ahimsa. But you know, again, my, Michael, you know, I'll bring you to my domain. Uh, Gandhiji, for instance, you know, talked about Ahimsa. And if you read his autobiography, there he talked about Ahimsa. And while talking about Ahimsa, he enumerated some of the important sources. And one, two important sources happened to be, uh, one, Buddhism, another is Jainism. Jainism. No, and, uh, 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 and he did not write much about Buddhism, but you know he drew on Buddhism while conceptualizing his approach to nonviolence, ahimsa. But one person, I mean, I I, I dealt, I, I referred to that, you know, Ambedkar. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambedkar is the one who was really, you know, moved or enamored, you know, by Buddhist philosophy because he wanted to uh, raise a kind of voice against uh, orthodox Hinduism. And in order to establish his point of view, he did not opt for either Islam or Christianity. So Islam was you know, anti-Hindus and being an Indian, he didn't like to be identified as anti-Hindu. And Christianity, that was a kind of foreign religion. So he didn't want to be identified with them either. And the option left for him was Buddhism. So, you know, uh, at the almost fag end of his life, he died in 1956. In 1954, he, along with his uh, disciples, about 5,000 of his disciples, they all got converted into Buddhism in Nagpur. You know? So, you know, the point I'm making that somehow the other Buddhism gave a platform to some of the top you know, nationalist minds, Gandhiji and B.R. Ambedkar, uh, to articulate, you know, their, um, I would say it's a kind of opposition to Hinduism, but they are to their, you know, innovative ideas. 
in which they conceptualized their approach to life. So I think, you know, from that point of view, uh, your lecture is a very powerful intervention in our understanding of uh, Ahimsa as conceptualized by Gandhiji and also later Ambedkar. So I think you know, in us, so we have to work actively against that, not to let that take complete control of us. So, uh, sir, uh, thank you very much for taking 10 12 questions. And I think all of my colleagues have been enjoyed a lot. And they are, the interactive uh, session is very much enjoyed by all of them. And that's the question uh, never ending. If I have, we are allowing much time, then questions will be coming uh, sooner than. Uh, so thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, virtually and attending the session and eliminating us. And we all are eagerly waiting to receive you in our campus physically soon after the pandemic is over. Okay. And then uh, let me hand over the uh, microphone to our VC set to uh, conclude the session and uh, offer formal vote a word of thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Michael, Michael, you know, I am upset and happy at the same time. Uh -huh. Happy because after a long time, I have had the opportunity to listen to you, a very thoroughly researched you know, presentation. So I'm very happy and I'm very happy because I at least you know, had a chance to present you to my colleagues here in Vishwabharati, in the university which I'm heading now. I'm upset because uh, the lecture is over. <laughs> so, but anyway, you know, the, uh, the, all good things come to an end. So, yes. uh, and because it has come to an end, we can think of a new beginning. So, in in due course, I'm sure now my colleagues, uh, as uh, my librarian, you know, the person who, who uh, dictated the, who told me the questions, he happens to be our librarian. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Nimai Shaha. Mm -hmm. And um, as Nimai mentioned, that most of my, uh, I mean, everybody, those who attended your lectures, they are very happy. Mm -hmm. And Nimai already has extended an invitation to you mm -hmm. before I did it. So I think uh, Nimai, you know, belongs to this particular area. And I am an outsider uh, in okay. that sense. So uh, with his invitation, I'm sure you can't say no to him. So next time when you make a trip to, India or this part of the world, um, please put uh, Vishwabharati in your, you know, itinerary, okay. and you know we'll be happy to have you, you know, as a visiting on a visiting assignment. I mean, yes. anytime, anytime, okay. whenever you are free, whenever you have time. Well, after um, Corona, after Corona. Yeah, sure, sure. After Corona, I mean, when it is made possible, in the the you know, the journey is relatively free from this kind of you know epidemic attack. Very so, good. You are welcome, and uh, we will be happy to host you. And I'm sure my students uh, here in the campus will be benefited, you know, by your lecture, and also, you know, the, the philosophical discourse which you uh, introduced, you know, by way of lecturing on Buddhism and violence. That's very interesting, and you know, given the fact uh, uh, that we can't be non-violent entirely, uh, as you said. If we stay together for three days, we'll start fighting. Uh, I mean, which I, which I, you know, uh, accept with a bucket full of salt yeah. because this is impossible. Because Michael, I know, I mean, the sort of bonding we have uh, for almost two decades, it is impossible. Yeah, we may <laughs> differ because you are a vegetarian, I am a non-vegetarian. Um, or, you know, you may like to walk a lot, which I may not because given my age, but otherwise, I don't think any, there is a difference because <laughs> philosophically, ideologically, you know, we are uh, at par with each uh -huh. other, uh -huh. and so I don't, I don't see any any violent kind of interaction between <laughs> me and Michael ever. You know, I'm telling this to my colleagues that you know we spend so many evenings together. Mm -hmm. We had discussion, we had disagreements, but it, it was uh, uh, you know, presented in a in a very persuasive, in a very academic way. So I, I don't have any doubt that even if we stay together for more than three days, we'll end up with fighting. You know, I, I don't agree with that. Let's, let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try. So, so Michael, you know, thanks a lot. I, I'm sure you have a class and you said you have an online class now. Yes, yes. But um, I thank you, you know, from the core of my heart. 
that you spent you know so much of your time with us with the with the kind of you know assurance from you that uh, please you know give us some time later according right. to your convenience uh, we'd love to listen to you and right. this lecture series is now has become really rich uh, given the fact that we have got somebody as you have rightly pointed out at the outset uh, from the humanities section of mm -hmm. knowledge and wisdom mm -hmm. so i think you have really added you know richness to our series and uh, thank you very much for that michael and thank you very um, much. I,